and again, this we're not we're not looking at language. We're not looking at well, I don't know the Greek, so I can't do that. We're not looking well. I've never been to school, so I can't. We're not looking at that. We're not saying oh well, uh, I'm a, I'm not a student, so I can't. No, we're not. Say this is the living word and the written word interacting in your life, revealing the passage to you, and you can do this if you want to. If you don't want to, don't mess with it. But you have to want to. And if you want to know Jesus, you're going to want to. Because this is a way to know him. Now, if you just want tickles up in your, on your spine, I don't know. Go take a cold shower. You'll get them. But, see, we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with, man, I want to know truth in my life. And I want to be able to portray it both in mouth and in life to my world. How's that going to happen? Well, it isn't just going to happen. It's going to be you interacting between the living word and the written word interacting in your life and you get right in the middle of that thing and that interaction begins to change your life experience because you begin to know the reality of the truth of Jesus through his word. Now, let's go back to the personal greetings just just for the fun of it and walk through some of that. Okay, when you come to the personal greetings, you've got, you've got, a, you've got a, a, let, me, let me restate this. So that we'll uh, follow our pattern. I'll just brace all this. Okay. Now we're starting out in the chapter with personal. Now there isn't a right or wrong on this, folks. I'm just showing you how I do it. You don't have to do it this way. Doesn't matter. Just so you begin to saturate in the word. So you got personal greetings, which is chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. All right. Now, as I begin to look at this section, I find out he starts with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He's introducing himself. So he's giving us, and I'm going to indent this. Why? Because it's under personal greeting. I'm indenting it to show you it's subordinate to this, this, this title. So it's the person writing. Now, I'm going to put quotes around anything that I make as scripture. Paul, since it's coming right out of the scripture, I'm not making it up. Paul, I put quotes around it, which indicates to me that's the scripture itself. And this is 1, chapter 1, verse 1b, or 1a, rather, 1a, the first part of the first verse, the person writing. Well, who was the, fir- who was the person writing? Paul. Now, you could do a whole study, obviously, on who Paul is and where he came from and, and, the, and saw Tarsus and the name change, and, and you know all that, so I don't need to go into all of that and lay all that out for you, but if we were going to do a proper study on this, it, that would have to all be involved. And, and, and here he is, uh, he's writing to these people in, in Ephesians, and you could go back to the book of Acts and see his interaction with the people of Ephesus and how the church was started and what was all going on, and you could get into all of that. And wow, what a study that would be. And that all becomes important background, but we want to stick with the text. Now, he, he says, I'm the person writing, Paul, but I'd like to talk to you about my position. I am an apostle. Oh, that came right out of the scripture, so I put quotes around it. I'm an apostle. Paul, an apostle. And again, that comes from 1-1-A. I'm an apostle. Well, what's an apostle? Well, there were 12 of them. Whoops, Judas, he went out and hanged himself. Now there's only 11. No, we replaced him with Matthias. Okay, we still got 12. What was the function of the apostle? The function of the apostle was he was an eyewitness. But the real function of the apostle was, in the book of Acts, he was not, he was not a, uh, a church organizer. He was not a, uh, he was not a bishop. Over the church, he was not a uh, overseer of the churches. He was not a uh, what we would call in, our, in the Nazarene church a DS. He, he wasn't a DS. He wasn't the pope. Who was an apostle? He had one single function, and that one single function, according to Acts four, was he was to be a witness of the resurrection. 
In fact, when you get into Acts chapter 1, uh, where they replaced Judas, they said the criteria for the guy who's going to become an apostle has to be that he was with Jesus from the time he was, Jesus was baptized all the way through the ascension. And when he was with Jesus all that time, then he would qualify to be an apostle. Whoa. Well, if he's supposed to be, now think about this, think this through. If he's supposed to be an eyewitness of the, uh, uh, and give testimony to the resurrection, uh, okay, why would he have to be there when Jesus was baptized? All he'd have to do is be there when Jesus was raised from the dead. So if I came along and said, oh, I, I want to be an apostle. Nope, you can't, manly. Well, I was there all the time. Oh, no, I stayed home on the, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. <gasps> yeah, I missed that one. Well, you're, yeah, you don't qualify then. Well, but I, I know all about the resurrection. Ah, too bad. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't get it on the Sermon on the Mount. See, that, does that make any sense? No, doesn't make a bit of sense. Except when you understand what being, an, being a witness of the resurrection. Do you know nobody witnessed the resurrection? Do you realize the resurrection of Jesus was the only event that took place in the life of Jesus that we didn't have anything to do with? <laughs> the birth of Jesus? Hey, Mary was involved. <coughs> Joseph was, was there. Wise guys came along. Shepherds were all over the place. Come on. We interacted in that thing, and we're right at the heart of that event. Oh, the crucifixion, we sure participated in that one. There was no question about that. But the resurrection, we, we weren't even there. Nobody was there. An angel came down, rolled the stone back, and, and some ladies went in, but he was already gone. So nobody participated in the resurrection. So nobody was an eyewitness of the resurrection. We all, we saw him after but in the actual, wouldn't you like to have been there, saw his little toe move? Oh, 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 there his whole leg is shaking. Wow, wouldn't that have been great? But no, no, we weren't there, man. He just gone, raised from the dead. That's interesting. Well, how are we going to be a witness to the resurrection? Oh, what that meant for them was when they stood up and said, folks, I've seen the resurrected Lord. He is alive. Suddenly, the resurrect because they were filled with him, the resurrected Lord showed up. The spirit of the resurrected Lord began to penetrate the congregation. And as they talked about the resurrection, the resurrection presence began to, in fact, in Acts chapter 4, the disciples are preaching in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And the Sanhedrin is so ticked off. They are, oh, and you know what they were ticked off about? You know what irritated us about Jesus? The kind when we sat under the preaching of Jesus and what came out of Jesus just irritated the life out of it. Oh, just made us so mad. We're getting the same thing from these guys. So what irritated us about Jesus is irritating us about these guys. I bet they didn't hanging around Jesus. So as they talked about the resurrection, the resurrection of the Spirit of God within the person began to move through them. The resurrected Lord began to move through them and penetrated their crowd. So Paul comes along and says, I'm an apostle. Well, you can't be Paul. You, 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 weren't, you weren't one of the original. Ah, uh, listen, Jesus came down, bright light shining man, and I'm on my face, son. And listen, when I talk about the resurrection, whoa! He shows up. So if you want to be an authentic sent one, which is what the word means, sent one, how are you going to be that? Well, the church ordained me. Last year when I was here, I was ordained as a bishop in the ecumenical movement. I thought I'd get to wear a robe today, but I didn't. <laughs> so what are you talking about? I'm talking about this is I'm an authentic witness of the person of Jesus because he, when I talk, begins to move among us. Now, transport that into life. Wouldn't it be something to be one at Walmart? Whoa. And the flow of Jesus is happening in your life. Shh. And you're saturating all of Walmart with Jesus. People are saying, oh, brother. 
What is going on here? See, we go down to Wilson County Jail. We don't always preach just a couple of times, and we can't preach in every pod, but just to go in and just presence, just... See, what I want for my kids, man, is I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna fill my house with the presence. I, I, I want my boy to have to live in the presence. I want to so surround my wife with the presence. See, that's this. Now, this is not only position, but underneath the position, understand, we're going to, we're going to indent again because there's a subordinate idea underneath the position. He's an apostle. What is he an apostle of? You're afraid to answer. Of Jesus Christ. Come on, it's right there. I mean, I'm not asking you to make anything up. So there's this possession. I didn't spell it right, sorry. The possession, E-S-S-I-O-N. So underneath the po position is a possession. He's not just an apostle. See, anybody can be an apostle. I'm an apostle of the ecumenical movement. Fine, great, good for you. Go for it. But you know what I want? I want to be an apostle of owned and possessed by, which is the of deal. Owned and possessed by the person of Jesus. And listen, man, you can't buy me because I'm not for sale. Well, if you come to our church, we'll give you, I'm not for sale, son, because this is not about this is about, this is not about prestige. This is not about where I can go and get the best applause. This is not where I can go and get my ego fed. This is not about I like this group, don't like that group. This is about, hey, any place, anywhere, I am owned, possessed, mastered. We're talking the passage. So he is a possessed and mastered by the person of Jesus Christ. Now you'll note also along with the possession, there is another criteria of this position and that is purpose. Well, what's, what's the purpose of this apostleship? By the will. Wow. Put that in quotes, by the will. It is by the will of God. So there is a distinct, hey, I'm, I'm not on my own. Folks, this is not, yeah, well, I get up when I want to. No, I don't. Well, I go to bed when I want. No, I don't. Well, I got my schedule, don't. Three o'clock in the afternoon is not my schedule. I'm sorry. Well, I, hey, this is not by my will. I am under distinct, why? Because I'm possessed. I'm owned. I'm not on my own. I don't set the schedule. I don't say where I will and where I won't. See, we went to Lebanon and wanted to start a church. Why? Because we wanted to have a school of practical ministry. And to have a school of practical ministry, you've got to have practical ministry. <laughs> so we started a church to get the practical ministry. So we got to have the school. So we started the church. And you know what I want? I, I'd like to have a church full of middle, upper middle class people driving nice cars, uh, plenty of money, uh, wearing suits, uh, smelling good, uh, you know, with kids with straight teeth. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll have a nice church. Yeah, and normal Sunday school with normal people. How are you? Fine. God bless you kind of deal. So, you know who began to show up? <laughs> homeless people. I don't want homeless people. I hate homeless people. Stay away from me. I may rub off. I don't want to. And yet that's who showed up. So I'm saying, well, I don't want to minister to them. 
In fact, it works in reverse because they're here, rich people won't come. You know, nice, decent people won't show. Well, we're not going to expose our kids to those people. So I got to run them off, get rid of But see, God drove me against the wall and said, Manly, are you going to minister to the people I send you? Are you going to go out and set up your own crowd? Are you, by the will of, What about your ministry? See, I, I've got my dream. My dream is large coliseums, big stage, spotlight. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bishop Stephen Manley. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Folks, not blue jeans and homeless people that snore while I preach. <laughs> but hey, maybe I'm not in charge of this. Maybe this is not my deal. Maybe I'm an apostle who's owned by the person who's under a distinct will Oh, let me give you this. Subordinate to the purpose is preeminent. It is by the will of God. Now, you get any bigger than that if you can. I'm sorry, Bishop Redfern, but this is by the will of God. The will of God which is top brass here. Do you see a sermon in this? <laughs> wow. And man, we didn't look at any commentaries. We didn't, hey, we just looked at the passage and said, whoa, what on earth? Let's break this thing down. See what he's, what is he saying? You can do this. You don't have to be smart to do this. You can do this. <laughs> you can be ugly too. You can still do it. <laughs> See, you, if you'll give it time and the living word and the written word and let them interact in your life and live in this thing, you can. Now, you don't have to all have all peas. I got that. You can make up your own thing, but hey, you, you can get this. Uh, you want to say anything? <laughs> well, you say, I'm not a preacher. Well, we're, not talking about, we're not talking about preaching, preaching. We're talking about life, people. And every Christian needs to get into a saturation in the Word of God where the Word of God is coming alive in you so you can live it out to your people Amen. in Walmart at your home. So this is just Christian stuff. If you're going to be a Christian, this is Christian stuff. Amen. Uh, in years gone by... Uh, I used to every week uh, have a Sunday school class or something. I was always talking to young people. So uh, in the course of talking to young people, one thing I intended to always say was, I have never met in my entire life a Christian teen who didn't have a definite, distinct, aggressive Bible study in their life. Yeah, I've never met a Christian, and take the teen out of it now. I've never met a Christian who didn't have a definite, distinct, aggressive Bible study in his life. Why? Because <laughs> you can't make it if you don't. The world will tear you up. If you're not in this, if you're not into the book, and the book, the written word and the living word coming together, 
to reveal in you the truth of what really is going on, you'll go off on some tangent and start, whoa, I don't know what you'll do, licking frogs or whatever you do. And, and, and who knows, who knows what you'll end up with if you don't have the word. And if you just got the word, you'll end up in some legalistic, judgmental, uh, 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 narrow-minded, closed-off kind of narrow uh, 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 kind of a deal. If you don't have the living word and the written word interacting in your life and revealing truth from the scripture, Jesus and Jesus, you won't make it. Okay? Well, if you don't have anything to say, let's move on. Uh, okay, then he moves to the next, where there's sections. See, this is a cluster of material, personal greeting, verse 1 through 2. Then there's sections within the cluster. So we're dealing with the section. The first section is personal person writing. Now the second section is uh, persons greeting. <laughs> or addressed, I guess is the way I put it, but it doesn't matter. Person's addressed. Who, who is he talking to in the passage? And this is 1, 1, B, which is to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Person's addressed. Who are the person's addressed? It's to the saints. Quotes, because that's the quotation. They're, they're, the person's addressed are the saints. Good night. Were they all saints in Ephesus? <laughs> Were they all st had a statue of themselves sitting in the window? Were they saints? Well, what's the saints? So you've got to get into, hey, who are saints? <gasps> you are a saint. Oh, yeah. I'm not perfect. We're not talking about being perfect. See, that's the wonder of the thing. That Do you know that in the Sermon on the Mount, the close of chapter 5 is, be ye perfect. Everybody who, everybody who feels like they are, raise your hand. Oh, come on, nobody's perfect. Well, the, the problem is, see, you think of being perfect as eliminating mistakes. What if you could be perfect in all of your mistakes? That's an awesome thought, isn't it? That perfection is not the elimination of all mistakes. Perfection is in the middle of all my mistakes. Guess what's going on in my life? I am perfect. Well. And then you know what he says immediately after that. Be ye therefore perfect. And then he gives you an example. Like your father in heaven is. Oh, good night. I'm supposed to be like God. You're kidding me. Perfect like God? Who can be perfect like God? One of the favorite sayings of one of our guys at our church is, Hey, I don't walk on water. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, I'm not Jesus. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not Jesus. I'm not on water. See, I'm not perfect like, whoa. Well, I've got to be like God. Well, how is God? He's omnipresent. That's true, but no, nowhere in the scriptures are you ever asked to be like God in omnipresence. So if you've got your heart set on being omnipresent, bug off. You're never going to get that. Even in heaven, you're not going to get that. Well, God is all-knowing. I want to be all-knowing. You've never been invited to get in on that, people. You may think you are, but you haven't been invited to get in on that. And when you get to heaven, you're not going to be all-knowing either. Because only God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. I want to be, I want the power, brother, the power. God has not invited you to get in on the power. You know what God has done? He has split himself down the middle and cracked himself open and said, hey, the Trinity has literally opened itself and say, forget the power, forget, forget the omnipresence, forget the omniscience, the all-knowing stuff. Come on. We want you to be a part of our heart, our nature. What's the nature? Perfect. What's the nature of God? 
God is love. What am I going to have perfect love in the middle of all my mistakes? And yeah, I said some things that I was just, man, I was just mouthing off because, I, you know, wow, I didn't mean anything. And you got all upset and got your feelings hurt. And you know, what a dumb thing. If I'd have known, I wouldn't have said that for a million. I wouldn't have hurt your feelings. I would rather, why? Because I love you. So I, what do I do? I come to you and say, oh, please forgive me. What a big mouth. Man, I, I'm so sorry. And, well, you made a mistake. I know, but you're still perfect in the middle of the mistake. Come on. Wouldn't it be something to be filled with this nature? And to be perfect, not because I had perfect action or I had perfect judgment or because I perfectly knew everything, but because I'm a saint so filled with him that out of me flows nothing but who he is in the middle of all my mess because I'm so stupid. Somebody said amen to my stupidity. (laughs) You're right. Oh, you're right. Just call my wife. She'll tell you. Oh, my, my. Isn't, isn't that something? Now, do you realize that these saints, the setting, now this is, sorry, the setting, this is intended, why? Because this is under the person's address. There's a setting in which they're perfect. They're saints in a setting. Well, what is the setting? Well, he tells you who are in Ephesus. In other words, They're not saints in the church. See, they're not saints in the heavenly realms. They're not saints in the spiritual realities. They are saints down on the streets at their job in Ephesus. And you know what Ephesus is like? We'll study it and find out. But down on their streets in a pagan culture with pagan gods and people who worship all kinds of things and do all kinds of, oh, and all kinds of perversions and all kinds, oh, man, what a mess. That's where they're, they're not saints in the monastery. They're not saints in the cave. They are saints in the streets of Ephesus. See, when you come to me and say, I hate my job, oh, they are so unchristian. My boss is so mean. My people I work with tell dirty jokes. They're just, oh, 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 I just hate my job. Oh. Wish God would give me a nice job with a Christian company where they play Christian music and they have Christians and they only hire Christians and we all sing Christian songs and we all pray with each other. And Good night. That's not where he wants you. He sent you as a missionary down to your job. And you're going to be an apostle full of Jesus Christ with a destiny on your hands given to you by God to minister as a saint in the midst of your world. Think there's a sermon in all that? (laughs) Man, this is just the greetings, people. we got to move on. We'll never get through this. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Well, what's the sourcing of this? The sourcing of all of this. He begins to tell you. They are saints who are in Ephesus and faithful. See, the sourcing of this is faithful. Faithful. They are a people who have literally been welded to the person of Jesus by faith, which is brought full in their lives. They're faithful, full of faith. And that produced a consistency in their life, which gave them the ability to be called saints in the mess of their world. So we'll move on. We could just, you know what the scope of this is? 
the scope of this, they are faithful in Jesus Christ. Or Christ Jesus, I guess it is. So the scope within which they operate is the person of Jesus. In other words, in my world, I am, hey, I'm going to be an apostle. I'm going to be an apostle fulfilling a destiny given to me by God that's going to place me on my streets as a saint, one who is exclusively belonging to Jesus in my world, in my pagan society, and the boundaries within which I'm going to operate are the person of Jesus. I will not step out of the boundaries of the person of Jesus. Jesus is the boundary within which I move and have my being. Uh, in the Old Testament, covenant is really strong. Uh, covenant, the word covenant is used 248 times in the Old Testament. Uh, and there were all kinds of covenants. God had covenants. Everybody had covenants. Marriage was a covenant. Everything was a covenant. Which a covenant meant agreement between, there was a bilateral covenant, which meant an agreement between two equal parties. So, hey, uh, you and I got together in a room with a lawyer or whatever, and you're on that side of the oak table, I'm on this side of the oak table, and you say, let's enter into a covenant. I say, I agree. And so you say, I'm bringing this to the table. Here's what I'm going to contribute. What are you going to contribute? And you say, well, I'll contribute this. Okay, I'll contribute this. You contribute that. And uh, we'll agree that we're going to do this, 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 and this. We shake hands, enter into a covenant. Marriage, again, was that kind of a covenant. Hey, my wife says, I'm contributing this to the marriage. I say, I'm contributing this to the marriage. Her and I shook hands, or a little more than that, but whatever. <laughs> and, uh, hey, if you don't do what you say you're going to do, then, hey, I'll beat the living daylights out of you. And I said, yes, dear, uh, I, I'll do what you tell me to do. So we entered into this covenant, two equal parties. Now, think about this. God came and said, I want to have a covenant with you. Okay. Uh, God, what do I have to contribute? Nothing. I have nothing. All my righteousness is filthy rags. God can turn stones into children of Abraham who can preach and sing better than I can. So my talent is worthless. So what, what, what do I have to offer? Nothing. I have nothing to bring to the table. So God said, don't worry about it. Instead of having a bilateral, oh, the thing of this, instead of having a bilateral covenant, we'll have a unilateral covenant, which means it's all one-sided. <laughs> I'll do it all, God says. I'll make all the provisions for you. You don't have to bring anything to the table. Hey, I'll provide all the forgiveness. I'll provide all the peace. I'll provide all the resources. I'll provide all the blessings. I'll provide, 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 provide. And all you have to do is stay, in the, stay within the boundaries of the covenant. Well, what's the boundaries of the covenant? Jesus. Stay within the intimacy of the relationship with the person. And everything I want for you will be yours. Uh, what kind of an example can I give you? Uh, South Carolina. God came one day and said, oh, I really did good in creating South Carolina. The state of South Carolina. The weather, the landscaping, oh, I really did great. South Carolina, the beach, South Carolina. Oh. I'm going to place all my blessings in South Carolina. And listen, all you have to do to be blessed by God is just stay in South Carolina. <laughs> the boundaries of the covenant is South Carolina. Just live in South Carolina. Just don't get out of South Carolina. But you know what you guys do? You go to North Carolina. <laughs> you go to Florida. What are you doing? Stay in the boundaries. See, as you get into Ephesians, this is what he's talking about. In Christ Jesus, this theme is just going to explode. I'm going to take everything I want you to have, and I'm going to put it in the person of Jesus. 
and all you have to do, you don't have to do anything. Well, what's the rules? There aren't any rules. How many times I got to go to church? You don't have to go at all if you don't want to. How many times do I have to witness? Don't witness only when you want to. How much money do I have to give? Don't have to give any unless you want to. How many times do I have to preach? Don't have to preach at all if you don't want to. Don't do anything you don't want to do. In fact, if you don't want to do it, we don't want you to do it. Why? Because you'll mess things up. You think I want somebody teaching my kids about Jesus when they don't want to? Mercy. I hate you kids and I wish I weren't here, but I want to tell you Jesus loves you. <laughs> well, that's really going to teach them well, isn't it? So if you don't want to teach, if don't, don't, don't teach. I'd rather have no teacher than somebody who's teaching that doesn't want to. So don't do anything you don't want to do. But if you will just live within the boundaries of Jesus, the wonder of his presence and the greatness of the boundary of his embrace will literally bring to your inner life such a wonder that you, whoa, you'll find, you know, I want to go to church. Whoa, I, I, I want to be good. I, I want purity. I, I want to be a witness. I, I want the flow of God. I, I want people to be different. I, I want, I, oh, it burns in my bones. I, I want to know the word. I want to know his truth. I want. See, that's this. Got carried away, sorry. Now, he then moves to the third section in this personal greetings. The third section is uh, in verse 3, or verse 2, rather, I'm sorry, verse 2, which is the personal blessing. Which is 1, 2. And what are the personal blessings? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the personal blessing starts with charisus. Charis, charis, C-H-R-I-S, charis, which is a Greek word, which is the word, the Greek word for grace. So he begins with the idea of grace, 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 grace to you. Now, another word for grace is love. So what's he doing? Pouring love. What love? Well, I'm in Jesus, so I'm just going to give you. See, if I'm on my own, I hate your guts. Yeah, I mean, I, can't, I don't know what to tell you. The only people I love are people that contribute and help me. See, I love you because you're an electrician, and you can do my electrical work for me. For nothing. I love you. Oh, I got plumbing problems. Oh, I love you. You're a plumber. <laughs> oh, my car isn't working. Where's the, where's the me mechanic I can love? See, my love is so... So where does grace come in? Grace comes in that, oh, I love you. See, the test of your Christianity may be how many people you love that can't give anything back to you. They make no contribution to you at all. In fact, they're always taking from you. See, I love my wife. She makes me look good. She's so beautiful. Just walking beside her, people go, whoa, he's a lucky dog. She loves me with grace. Because I don't have anything to contribute or make her look good with. You weren't supposed to agree. <laughs> so, just an example. Just an example. So, this grace thing. And, oh, this grace is concentrated. So, underneath, and this is getting down where you probably can't see it, but it's concentration, which is... Uh, invented under great uh, under car, uh, charis, uh, which is grace, and uh, it's invented because it's concentrated. And who's it concentrated? Grace to you, to you. It's concentrated to you. Well, who's the to you? Well, obviously, Paul is writing to a group of people in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. 
and you can get into the study of them and who they are and whatever, and, and that would all be good. But take the to you and see, it's never grace to me. See, he didn't say, and grace to me, because I'm so special and phenomenal and talented and good looking and got money too. Isn't God lucky to have me? See, it's not that. It's grace always to you. See, this grace, which is the love of God spilling through me in the boundaries of the person of Jesus, is always to others. Always to others. Do you understand that? Always to others. Never to me. So the love of God is always to me, through me. Which is the whole pattern of this, see? That, hey, I, oh, I'm an apostle. Owned and possessed by Jesus Christ oh, there, because there is an overwhelming destiny that goes into the eternities right from the heart of God because I am this saint, which means I'm exclusively his on my streets, down in Ephesus, in the day in and day out grind of my life because I have this overwhelming faith which sets up the boundaries in the person of Jesus Christ to spill this love to you. Phenomenal. Oh, no. Now, there is a contentment in all of this. I know, I can hardly wait to talk to you about this. Contentment in all of this. Which is what? Peace. Do you know how many times everything we've said from here down has been destroyed because I was just all upset? I came down to the church to preach, and can you believe it? Somebody took my parking spot, and it was raining, and I didn't have an umbrella, and it just made me so upset. Get yourself calmed down so you can preach the gospel about the love of God to everybody. <sighs> and I didn't have any peace. And when you don't have contentment, and you don't have, hey, take my parking spot. Because I can guarantee you, when I come to church, there's going to be upset. There's going to be people ask me, how's the ministry going in Lebanon? Messy. Real messy. Why? We're in a mess all the time. But that's the opportunity of ministry is messy. Well, I'll tell you, our ministry is really going well. We don't have any cigarette butts in our parking lot. Whoa, then go to a restaurant, get some, and throw them around. <laughs> Why? Because people, this is ministry. Ministry is messy. But their peace in the midst of the mess is where ministry takes place. So see, he's, 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 call, he's calling us to a contentment in the middle of this, 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 this Ephesus, streets of Ephesus. Do, do you get that? So, moving on. Underneath that, and then and underneath contentment, oh, by the way, uh, contentment is under uh, uh, charis. So it's not indented under a concentration, but it's in underneath charis because it's grace and peace, those are equal in the passage. So underneath contentment, indented, uh, subordinate is the cause. What's the cause? Well, he says it's peace from God. Oh, man. It's from God. The, con the, the, the contentment, the peace, comes from God. Not your circumstances. What do you want to do with that? How are things going in your life? That's not the point. I got financial problems, I got four flat tires, my engine conked out, and my wife wrecked her car. So, well, whoa, you got problems. No, I've got peace that comes from God, which has nothing to do with circumstances. And folks, when your circumstances dictate your peace, then it's not from God, and you aren't on the Christian trail. 
See, the call of Christ is to be in the midst of a sovereign God who is literally dictating to your life because you are, you are possessed by Jesus and there is this will which is an eternal destiny of God for your life and it comes from God and you are a saint that belongs exclusively to him on the streets of Ephesus and by faith you are operating within the sphere of the, of the person of Jesus Christ who is literally spilling his grace and love through your life to others which gives you this contentment that in the midst of all the upset of circumstances down to a cross you say, Father, it's okay. We're talking ministry. We're talking ministry. Now, underneath the cause, we don't have room to write this, but indented underneath the cause are two things. There's conception, where he says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. So the cause is from God, but how does it come from God? He's birthing it into you. Now, I don't need to explain the birth process to you, but here's a yellow elf, a young lady, and here's a handsome young man, and they get together and birth. And when something, when, when something is birthed, when someone is birthed from their relationship, it's not her. Well, it is her. It's not him. Well, it is him. Well, it's his big feet and her beautiful eyes. Well, maybe he's got her chin. No, he's got his, she, the, the kid has her, his, his ears. She can get mad and say, I'm taking my half and I'm leaving. He can get upset and say, I'm taking my half and leaving. No, they're not. Why? They have birthed something that is her and him that has come together in such an integrate merger that you can't separate your half out of it. Now think about this. Oh, God is 